Uh, December greetings and welcome to the Asian American and Asian Research Institute's final lecture series. Uh, I'm Anthony Wong, program coordinator of the Institute. Thank everyone for joining us in person and also online for tonight's talk, uh, Racial Battle Fatigue in Faculty, Perspectives and Lessons from Higher Education, uh, co-edited by uh, Nick Nicholas D. Hartlip to my far right and Daisy Ball to my left. Uh, their book examines the challenges faced by diverse faculty members in colleges and universities and highlights the experiences of faculty of color, including African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, and indigenous populations. Uh, Nicholas D. Hartlip holds the Robert Charles Billings chair in education at uh, Berea College, where he chairs the Department of Education Studies. Uh, prior to Berea College, Dr. Hartlip chaired the Department of Early Childhood and Elementary Education at Metropolitan State University, an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution, uh, acronym is ANAPZ, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, while there, he also served as the graduate program coordinator, and you can also find his full bio online. Uh, Daisy Ball is assistant professor and coordinator of the criminal justice program in the Department of Public Affairs at Roanoke College, uh, Salem, Virginia. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection of crime, uh, race and crime uh, with an emphasis on the criminal justice contact of Asian Americans. Uh, they've actually previously given at least two talks prior to here and those links and videos are available online on our website and you can view those after this presentation over the weekend. Uh, please welcome Nicholas Hartlip and Daisy Ball. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, as Anthony mentioned, <clears throat> Daisy and I have um, shared the, the stage before, but it's always great to be back um, and thank you for having us. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, it's great to be here. So we appreciate uh, the invitation and speaking with you tonight. So we're, we're going to talk about a book that was published in 2019. And um, you might say, well, that's dated. Well, it actually is a nice beginning point uh, of the pandemic. It kind of marks where how long um, the pandemic has been with us. And so um, we had um, a goal of presenting. I think we are even scheduled, but then when the pandemic occurred, we had to cancel. So um, it's finally good to, to be here. So our book was published by Rutledge, and it's in a book series, uh, Diverse Faculty in the Academy, which uh, Dr. Fred Bonner um, edits. And it was actually the first book in a series. So I was very honored, um, and I was really happy to, to do this project with Daisy here. So <clears throat> Racial Battle Fatigue, the book, it examines the lived realities of diverse faculty uh, members, as well as um, people who hold positions within higher ed. So it might not be a faculty member, it might be uh, a fellow or a diversity um, consultant, um, but they're, they're titled people um, within that ecosystem. And it's structured in a way that, well, Daisy will talk about the structure. Yeah, so our book is unique in terms of a book uh, about racial experiences in higher education. So the way that we organize the book is the first part um, is focused on um, the racialized experiences of Asian Americans. Then our second part focuses on, uh, excuse me, African Americans. Then the second part focuses on Asian Americans. Um, then we look at Latinx in US higher education. Um, then the politicized experiences of Native Americans in higher ed. And then that fifth section is particularly unique insofar as we're looking, as Nicholas mentioned, at, um, at people who hold so-called diversity positions or diversity fellowships. So this might be a postdoc who applies for a uh, non-tenure track position, but rather something that's tied to their diverse status, whether that's uh, them personally or their research, their research agenda, uh, the work that they've done. Um, and so we're looking uh, across institutional, um, uh, various institutional positions and also within racial ethnic identity groups. So the first question you might ask, well, what is racial battle fatigue? That, you know, if you're um, hearing that word, you might think it's just an academic term or it's scary, battle, fatigue, race, right? But RBF refers to the stress and strain members of racially marginalized populations experience, tensions which emanate from coping with the fighting against 
the racism. So while colleges and universities are often thought of as progressive forward-thinking institutions, they are not immune from this phenomenon, for they came of age during eras of white domination. So when you think about it very simplistically, higher education historically has been a white space. Evidence of that is we call it the ivory tower, okay? The tower of whiteness, the tower, right? And um, higher ed has been uh, a space that hasn't been too inviting uh, for BIPOC people. Um, and because of that, you know, we have, Anthony mentioned, I worked at a minority serving institution in, in Anna Pizzi. Um We have minority serving institutions, HBCUs, um, I, I'm not sure about you all if, if you've been watching um, Deion Sanders and him moving from a HBCU to uh, a PWI to become the football coach there, but that's in the media a lot. But, so these institutions really, um, because of the context, people of color uh, who work in those spaces, they, they experience um, racial battle fatigue. Yeah, so um, what's important to know about racial battle fatigue, beyond just an academic term coined by Smith, it's uh, something that people experience viscerally, right? And so this is something, and here we have some symptoms or some, some of the outcomes of going through this experience, but this is something that impacts one physiologically. So it's, it's more, more than just an experience, but it's having an impact possibly on one's health and one's well-being. And so that's an important aspect to know when, when talking about some of the stories that we're going to share tonight. So you might, I, I want to share a little bit about like how we come to this work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why did we choose to edit a book? Why did we go and approach the book series um, to do the first book? Well, I had an interesting experience at a minority serving institution and I did experience racial battle fatigue. So the first thing that we need to clarify is racial battle fatigue can be experienced in different spaces. So it's not like, okay, people of color at PWIs experience racial battle fatigue. They can, um, but it's not necessarily going to be the case all the time. Conversely, uh, you can work at an HBCU and you might be black. You'll, you, you can still experience racial battle fatigue. So um, just because I'm Asian and I work at an Asian serving institution does not mean I'm immune from experiencing racial bad fatigue. So the particular case that I share in the book is about my experience working at Metropolitan State University. Uh, Minnesota is a very progressive state um, and the institution I worked at um, was very progressive. The school, uh, the, the school of Urban Education where I worked, it was started by the, the state because the state had a shortage of teachers of color and they, they said, by fiat, we will start a school and um, there'll be rules. You need to graduate um, diverse um, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was the particular union that um, caused me a great uh, deal of racial bowel fatigue. And I want to read, it's on the screen, but it's interesting. Research by Hollis in 2016, Hollis writes, um, the research considered a sample of 142 community colleges uh, through a correlation analysis to reveal that 67% of those who belong to unions are subject to workplace bullying. 3% higher than the general population reporting their experiences in relationship to workplace bullying at community colleges. Further, 76% of people of color in unions are also affected by workplace bullying in community colleges. In contrast, 68% of people of color not in unions are affected by bullying. So it was really interesting to me when I came across this research. Um, and I write, the tragic irony of a white union abiding by such orthodoxy and dogma is similar to the pigs of George Orwell's animal farm who proclaim all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. So I write that MSI's minority serving institutions support and serve students of color and Native American students. And by the way, um, Metropolitan State had quite a few um, indigenous students. Um, Yet they, at times, may not be serving their faculty of color or Native American faculty well. Something must be done. And so 
I always think about this book. I was interested in the book because much of what we write about the student experience similarly can be written about at the faculty experience. Students experience isolation, lack of belonging, the same can happen to faculty. So in the introduction to the book, one of the things that we do are share stories about ourselves and our experiences with racial battle fatigue. And I'm a white woman and I haven't experienced racial battle fatigue except through my experiences of colleagues who have experienced it. Or um, for example, serving on a number of search committees for hi hiring committees in academia. Um, and one of the things that's, that I observed on uh, chairing a number of committees at a previous institution was a bunch of white people sitting in a room wanting to hire diverse, faculty members and trying very hard to, but making mistakes such as the one you see on the screen. This was an ad I came across. It wasn't at the university I was currently. But the ad says, we, we want to hire this visiting lecturer. This is a non-tenured position. It's a non-benefited contract position. Um, we don't have very many people of color on our campus, and so therefore we're very interested in diverse um, applicants. And so perhaps the people who wrote this were well-meaning, but it's really shocking, right, when you read this on the screen for, for the takeaway message. Let's offer a non-contracted, non-benefited uh, position to specifically targeting a group of people. Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed, I know at, at an institution I was at previously, we also created a diversity fellows program. Um, these were always non-tenure track positions. And so what this often did is it encouraged diverse faculty to apply for less permanent positions uh, right after getting their PhD. And what's problematic about that for those of us in academia, we know that those years right after graduation is uh, when you're most, most um, perhaps prolific in terms of publications, and you've got to get a certain number of publications in order to work towards your tenure. And if instead you're working in this non-benefited position, it's a non-permanent position, your time might be taken with that sort of work. And one of the things we'll talk about tonight is that um, diversity fellow positions as we experience in the book are things that bring with them not just um, the fact you're, so to speak, a diverse candidate and then um, hire, but that there's a lot more work uh, required of you. And so we'll get into that with some of the stories that we'll share tonight. So I want to talk a little bit about our methodology. Um, the way that we constructed the stories in this book is by asking the people we wanted to hear from themselves. So rather than a top-down extractive approach, which you often see in social sciences or academic, criminological, sociological research, um, perhaps education research too, we take an auto-ethnographic approach. Um, this is unique for a collection of this type. Um, and Autoethnography, as we see here on the screen, is defined as an approach to research that seeks to describe and systematically analyze personal experience in order to understand cultural experience. So we're interested, if you know what ethnography is, we're interested in understanding the lived experience from the perspective of the people who will actually are, are members of that culture or subculture, rather than a researcher coming in and saying, well, I'm going to study you and I know what questions to ask. We want to hear from the people themselves. And so that's the approach that chapter authors took. We explained to them what the autoethnographic approach is. And from there, we let them write their chapters in whatever style we found to be, uh, they found, excuse me, to be the most relevant and important to them, given the focus of our, of our project. Um, this is coming from the respondent's vantage point rather than um, the social scientist. One of the things that was striking to me, and we've had a number, a number of conversations about this, is that uh, many of the people who wanted to share their stories were concerned about doing just that because they were worried about compromising their positions at their academic home at the time they were writing. Right. So I remember one person, for example, said, I, this is an important collection, I want to share my story, but I'm worried that if I do, I'll get in trouble or I'll get fired. And um, so this individual asked, and we talked to Fred Bonner, the um, series editor about this, but we said this person wanted to know, could they use a pen name? And um, it, we had conversations about this, and eventually we decided, no, if we're all going to share our names, we all need to share our names. But chapter authors were concerned from the get-go about being part of a collection of, uh, of this because of the non-permanency of the positions that many of them held. Um, and then another kind of catch-22 to this is, let's say we had said, sure, you can use a pen name, then they wouldn't have been able to get credit for the publication, and that wouldn't have been something that appeared on their Vita. So um, if they hadn't used their real name, they would have done the work, but they wouldn't have gotten the academic credit, so to speak, towards tenure or promotion or what have you uh, in terms of their publications. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we also had to balance, um, kind of interrelated to that, we had to balance allowing them to have the, 
their voices as authors, we had to work within a structure with the mm -hmm. publisher. So at times, the publisher uh, was um, causing some of the chapter contributors racial battle fatigue, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, why are you why are you suggesting I edit this? Why can't it be published as it is? What words are you using? And so it it's part of this work, um, <clears throat> and part of the reason why it's so important that these stories are published. Um, uh, they're counter stories, but really they're cases. And so the case can be made, you know, when we have documented cases, we do have a problem. We do have a, a pandemic, um, to use that language, a pandemic of racial battle fatigue that people are experiencing. This particular chapter contributor, Anita, um, her chapter is titled, When You Name a Problem, You Become the Problem subtitled Encountering Whiteness at a Small Liberal Arts College as a South Asian American Tenured Professor. So uh, um, Dr. Ball mentioned that we had done different um, institution type. Well, here you had a case uh, of a um, South Asian um, professor at a liberal arts college. I work at a liberal arts college, Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, uh, about 1,500 students. Um, and the experience at liberal arts colleges might be similar or dissimilar to um, a larger institution um, like CUNY or a teacher's college here in New York, just thinking of those institution type. Um, her story was really interesting. I shouldn't say interesting, it was sad. Sad because um, that she had to um, write about stories um, and incidences that were happening at this liberal arts college. She published a blog with a colleague um, about some troubling things happening on campus. And the moment she did that, she became the problem. Why are you um, choosing to write about these things, right? And that's not um, uncommon. People of color, we, 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 we see that, we experience that. Um, but. Her chapter contributes a lot to the knowledge because, um, well, what do you do? Um, and, and I had a very fascinating um, conversation um, when I was out at Prairie View. Um, this professor could not rock the boat, let's say not do that blog, and be very silent, um, and the institution might go along with, um, be happy with her. That might be one approach. But that approach doesn't really save her because that institution doesn't care about her and could, you know, for whatever reason, have a problem with her. So my kind of um, belief is that it's important that um, scholars of color, we, we do what is in our heart. Certainly what's in our head, but what's in our heart. If you're experiencing racial bath fatigue, um, if you're watching this video later after the lecture, um, I encourage you to talk to people um, about what you're experiencing. You don't need to suffer in silence. Um, racial bath fatigue has caused um, suicide. Um, it's not something that should be held on the shoulders of the individual. So um, Anita's chapter was really interesting um, in, that per in, in that particular way. Yeah, and we mentioned earlier the uh, you know people being concerned about even contributing to the volume, and so each of the con contributors are brave insofar as they're sh they are sharing their story, but for the greater good, so that um, others recognize that you know it's not an, even though it feels like an isolating experience, it's not an individual problem or an individual experience. Absolutely, and this <clears throat> this chapter was really um, personal to me because um, as an Asian American male having to read narratives of trauma, of racial bowel fatigue experienced by other um, contributors, I had to relive some of my experiences. So it's interesting with Takumi Seto's uh, chapter, uh, which is titled Ignored, Pacified, and Deflected, Racial Bowel Fatigue for an Asian American Non-Tenured Professor, um, it, I had to relive some of my own experiences. Um, but his chapter um, really talks about how he was a superstar and um, that threatened whiteness. He was a superstar in that he was um, obtaining grants, doing great work, high quality work, and helping the institution. He was doing his job, doing it well. And he talks about a story where um, an administrator questions and, and actually discourages him 
from applying for a, a major multi-million dollar grant despite being well qualified. So the invisibility that Asian Americans experience um, being ignored, um, being deflected and pushed away um, is a real common occurrence, which again um, is a problem of higher ed. Here you have a, 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 a institution that would benefit from that grant dollars, would help students, would help whatever the, the grant program was, but you had a white um, administrator discouraging a young Asian American faculty member for doing that work. And that's, that's also a problem of retention. Faculty, if you're a BIPOC faculty and you're working in that space, hey, if you're being successful, you'll go somewhere else. So these institutions need to understand, and, 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 the, and the tables continue to turn, right? Because as um, Daisy mentioned, um, they have these programs to try to get more faculty of color, but they're pushing folks away. So it doesn't make sense uh, in many ways. Yeah, so another contributor, Jamison Lopez, um, talked about, as a Native faculty member himself, talked about two themes um, that I want to highlight. The first is that diverse fellows are often, diverse faculty members, are often asked to be the primary representative of whatever um, racial, ethnic, or political group, or what have you, that they're representing. And so one of the things that was asked of him was to lead student groups associated with his background, to mentor, to be the mentor, or um, kind of the, the caretaker of students who identified similarly as he did. And this became incredibly draining. So this is what in sociology we call emotion work. Um, this was expected of him in a range of different ways, and this wasn't something that uh, was asked of white faculty members, for example, right? And so this was additional work. But I'll also point out that it's work that is not, uh, we don't in academia, we don't get credit for, right? So when I'm writing my letter uh, to be considered for tenure and promotion, I don't get to talk about being a good friend to students or um, being, you know, for example, maybe um, mentoring female students or something like that. That's not what's important as much as how many publications have I generated in X number of months or years. Um, and then a second thing that Jameson talks about is that in his world, from his culture, the under, uh, in, his, in his world, life and work are intertwined. And so for him, work and his family are not two separate entities as we often talk about, but rather they, they go hand in hand. And so his university's culture didn't see it like that, and so therefore they discouraged him from being not just himself, but a member of a family and a greater cultural group. Um, and that was really important to him, and it, and it caused him great consternation. Um, and then Paula um, talks about, I'll tell, uh, I'll tell a story, and you can add to it, because um, you've, uh, um, spoken with her at greater length than I have. But one of the things that Paula um, emphasizes in her chapter is that if you want to hire us, hire us in our totality. Don't expect that we'll come and we'll be able to, you'll be able to check a box off because you've hired an African-American uh, woman, for example, to work at your university, but then she feels she has to modify her appearance so as to fit into your expectations of what a woman should look like or what a faculty member should look like. Um, and so she talks in her chapter about um, going, uh, forgetting something in her office one evening and running back upstairs to her office after hours. And there was a housekeep member of the housekeeping staff, a white woman um, there, and saw her uh, opening her office with a key and, and stopped her and said, you, what are you doing? You're trespassing. And she said, N no, I forgot my code in my office. And this woman said, but this can't be your office. And she was, and this was happening, this is the Deep South. Um, this, this simply, it, it was a total disjuncture. Um, the woman was simply unable to understand how could an African-American woman be opening her office door at this university? And so she tells that story quite eloquently. And that goes back to that whole thing of, well, you know, in this higher ed space, um, Paula didn't fit like she belonged, like she, that she was trespassing and, and, and shouldn't be in this space. And that's going to definitely cause racial battle fatigue if you're just going to do your job and each day it's, it's these, these microaggressions, or in this case, a macroaggression. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about the volume has been um, our intersectional I identities and age is definitely one. We talk about ageism, how old people are um, discriminated against. The, the opposite is true for adultism. As a young faculty member, let's say you went through your undergraduate, did a master's or PhD right away, and now you're in, in the academy, you can be in your 20s, your late 20s, or even your mid-20s. And higher ed is very hierarchical. 
and um, elitist and, 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 and stratified. Um, and it tends to be older full professors who have a lot of power. So a young assistant professor or a lecturer, diversity fellow um, in that space, um, you know, Paula definitely had um, double jeopardy for her identity. And um, it, it is interesting maintaining relationships with these contributors. I think Paula, Dr. Buchanan, she's at NC State. So mm -hmm. hello, uh, Paula, if you're watching this video later. So we um, want to highlight the themes that we drew from the chapter uh, contributors. And so, as I said earlier, we let each contributor take uh, tell their story in whatever direction they wanted it to go and uh, through whatever style or means of communication they preferred. Um, so then after we read over all of the chapters, we identified central themes. The first one is hiring experiences. And so I mentioned earlier being on a, on a number of search committees where really bad stuff was going on and uh, perpetrated by really well-meaning people. And so I think that um, one, one perhaps fix to this or one s partial remedy is for hiring uh, committees to understand uh, some of the mistakes that they're making in, in deliberation, right? And so what are we actually gonna consider in our deliberations? I remember being on a uh, search committee where um, we were talking about our need for diversity at the university and um, someone said, well, this candidate identifies as Asian American and a member of the search committee said, oh, but we just hired an Asian American last year. We don't need another one. As the one member of a category in a large department of 20 or so faculty members was enough, right? And I corrected him and he seemed offended uh, at the fact that I had pointed out, you know, his mistake. Um, so hiring experiences, both from like our own experiences being on, on search committees, but then also the stories that the contributors told about about um, really rude comments being made that affected their performance on their job interviews or what have you, like comments made during the dinner. If you've, if you've interviewed or hired you know, in academia, you know that often there's a dinner the night before your presentation or your, your campus talk. Um, and so those dinners can be really warming and welcoming or they can be really off-putting or make people nervous for their upcoming day where they're going to be in front of a small group of people making decisions about their future. Um, we also, I'll turn it over to you, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah and, and all of that really, number two, another theme is this, this white epistemology and alternate w uh, ways of knowing and being. So if the frame and the gaze is always through a white perspective, um, then there's judgments and bias attributed to behaviors and actions. Um, and um, that can lead to misunderstanding and certainly it can lead to the impact of racial bad fatigue for folks who are trying to navigate um, those spaces. Um, a lot of the, the book, um, well all of the book has actionable strategies which we talk about um, and we'll get to in a moment, but hiring is a big thing. And also, I, I think of, of even having to go through the whole process of getting a PhD, a terminal degree, so you can enter this privileged space in the academy to talk about race and study it. A lot of people were doing sociological work as eight-year-olds, eight mm -hmm. right? seeing patterns, seeing behaviors, reading the newspaper, reading uh, magazines. And so, um, you know, as a young man, I thought, okay, I'm gonna change it. You know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna study, get my doctorate and go into higher ed. And once you get there, you realize, oh God, it's, the problem is not as simple as one person. One, 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 one person can't fight this system. So um, I'm talking to you, um, folks who are uh, consultants uh, hiring hiring search firms you know you have that little decal higher ed jobs that D we want black and brown indigenous people um, why 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 aren't these problems um, improving right and so I think all of these central themes that were we uncovered in those narratives it was just in a book that's a small subsample of higher ed at, um, at the macro sense. So the white epistemology was a big finding, a big, um, and alternative ways of knowing and being is important, like Jameson's chapter. Work-life balance, it's not one and and a balance. They're braided, they're together. Um, you, and we want faculty to have, um, to bring their whole self to the space. Like 
you should be able to wear your hair the way you want. You should have that um, respect, right? We know that that's not the general practice though right now. Yeah, and another thing I'll point out from our um, central themes that we identified, um, you know, when you hear the term racial battle fatigue, the suggestion is that there is a battle, right? There's some sort of confrontation. But if you see number five, invisibility, or the, the sense of being ignored, simply not being paid attention to or being expected to be quiet is a, another form of a my, my, microaggression um, that chap several chapter authors talked about. So it doesn't always have to be in your face or over the top or, um, you know, uh, angry or what have you. Rather, sometimes these things are very under the surface and um, very quiet or one's not simply not involved in greater departmental activities or what have you and so that in and of itself is a is a, a, a quiet aggression I would say yep a absolutely <clears throat> and um, lastly the sense of belonging all of its intertwined and it's not so simple right I think of myself when I've analyzed myself my sense of belonging is I feel valued and matter when people acknowledge my work but they don't need to um, necessarily bring it up all the time if 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 people walked by me and never looked at me right if I was invisible I would not feel like I belonged so it wasn't just that way for the Asian American cases we're all humans um, the research really talks about sense of belonging in different ways what might work for Nicholas might not work for Daisy might not work for you um, but we we know this so we have to do things better and the, the actionable strategies are really um, a facet of the book that um, we told Dr. Bonner that we wanted it. Because we didn't want to just have war stories in a mm -hmm. book that sat on shelves. We wanted people that hired people, people had um, power and authority and resources to, to hear and read and learn from, from the book and say, okay, what do I do? The first thing we can do is mandatory trainings on racial microaggressions. All faculty, all staff, all students, the whole campus, the whole community, they need to know what they are, how to minimize them, and what to do if they, if they um, microaggress someone. And that's particularly important, you know, for for this to be when you're on a search committee, for you to be reminded of of this and maybe an additional training or what have you. And I want to speak just briefly about who the audience for this book is. So administrators certainly, faculty members certainly, but I know a number of um, faculty who have recommended the book to undergrads and graduate students, uh, undergrads who want to go on to get a PhD and become a faculty member, and then also people who are in graduate schools uh, currently. And they've said, read this book because you're about to enter this world, and we want you to know from the very Get go. What you're getting yourself into, but also so that you know it's not you, um, just you and your your you know your isolation. Um, so as we mentioned, Jameson several times, creating a culture where there's an intertwining of life and work, and it's not an either or. So it doesn't need to be dichotomous like that. Um, decolonizing curricula is incredibly important, um, and then finally, we want colleges and universities to bring staff, faculty on campus who can come as they are. And so rather than fitting what is expected of them in the shape or the mold or the form of what um, higher ed thinks they should be or look like or act like or speak like or their accent should be or their research agenda should be, but rather allow people to come to campus freely um, so as to enhance that campus. And I think the, that as the last bullet really, to me, uh, was encapsulated with the pandemic. So. Um, I'm not an essential worker. I had the privilege of remaining in my house and teaching online for two and a half, three years. Um, but it also allowed me to reconnect with my family. So I was hyper privileged from a class based occupational standpoint. Um, but also, it, it made me realize that um, the institutions, when we open back up, they were very quick on saying, get back into the office, where are your office hours? And students, a lot of students needed that. Some students could thrive under um, remote learning, virtual Zooms, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. Some couldn't. I work at a school that um, takes essentially all Pell eligible students and gives them a full ride, tuition free, um, so they can graduate with little to no debt. These are first generation students many times, very diverse, as well as international students. And so they didn't do very well um, under 
that uh, virtual learning, their sense of belonging uh, comes from um, peer uh, connections uh, with their faculty. So again, we kind of open by saying that faculty, what, what the students are experiencing, faculty are experiencing. And it seems very basic, but it's very profound, uh, at least from my, my vantage point. Um, the, the book was a great project, and um, I guess we could open it up to questions now and um, deeper conversation. I'd love to, we'd love to hear your opinions or experiences. Mm -hmm. Says that, could you elaborate on this strategy, create a culture where academic work and personal life is great? Give some examples. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Jameson gave us a vocabulary um, for it, but I can say personally, um, um, when I came to Bria College, I had a great campus interview. Um, this is what was said to me. Um, it was a black provost, female, and she said, Nicholas, the faculty adores you. We want to hire you. You're young, and that's an asset. You have an aging department. There's going to be some retirements. You are the future of this department. You can hire, blah, blah, blah. When I had that information, then I talked with my facu the, the faculty at lunch, and they said, you know, when are you coming? Are you going to accept the job, essentially, giving me those overtones. And I said, you know, I will come here if I can bring my whole self. They said, absolutely, you can bring your whole self. And I said, no, I, I felt like I was repeating myself again. I said, no, I, I will come here if I can bring my whole self. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm not going to be tied to my office. There's days I'm not going to come in. I have three daughters. Sometimes they will come into the building. Um, and they said, yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I travel. You can make the schedule. They understood it. So a real example, and I know the person is on Zoom, to me would be, I'm in the field of education. We should hear young kids' voices and laughter in the academic building. If not, that means we're too distant from the actual population we claim to serve. That's, that's, that's in my, my, my case. So, you know, in my building, we've, um, in the process of, we've made a, a room for breastfeeding mothers. We have these services for these communities and, and different populations. So um, to me, it looks like where um, it might also look like, and I've said this in other spaces, I make the schedule. Um, if you have young kids, be OK with some faculty members zooming in to a department meeting because they have to go get their kid. They might not have child care. Um, uh, older faculty or single faculty that don't have children, you know, um, they have to be give a little grace to the younger ones coming up. And I've heard my older mentors tell me that. So those are a few examples. I don't, yeah, and another example, one thing that uh, we talk a lot about at my college, uh, presently, Rennet College, is uh, we need to give offer more support for working caregivers is how we refer to it. And so that means everybody from people with small children to people with, uh, you know, uh, nieces and nephews who they're responsible for to people with elderly parents who need care. And so um, what we see is that oftentimes, you know, new faculty might have young children and then more senior faculty have parents who need their help and support and so rather than um, you know just assuming it's people with young kids we need to ex uh, support people who are caregivers across the board I know Jameson talked about uh, the idea that it was incredibly important for him as Nicholas stated to devote time to work and to devote time to life and he hated that he had to think of those things in separate categories but he also didn't want to be judged for the fact that he ha he was going to set boundaries on when he was going to answer email or when he, he would be uh, available for phone calls or could he attend certain meetings and another thing that we've talked about at my college um, is uh, for example our faculty meetings go from 4 until 545 once a month well lots of our uh, of us have children who are out of care at 3.30, 4.30. And so if the college simply hired a couple students to watch our kids for us in a room adjacent to the faculty meeting, you know, we would all share in uh, the joy of, of knowing the kids were fine. We didn't have to rush out of the meeting and we could all be perhaps more um, 
effective members of our departments if we were able to stay for the meeting, be there and engage without that stress of having to rush to get the children and without having to worry about uh, uh, am I going to be judged for leaving the space or am I not seen as serious of a, of a worker um, or a professional because I do attend to my children. So. And I'm glad you said the elderly too because because I did the opposite. I was talking about ageism that mm -hmm. might have been and, and totally true. We have, um, you know, you have to be aware and I boil it down to let's just be human like like at a basic level but um, these the institutions don't behave that way you know and that racial battle fatigue comes from that that questioning yeah if I'm a black woman I leave or you know I leave the meeting early will people judge me right that stereotype threat um, and um, but there are a lot of good suggestions um, Daisy, you mentioned about the, the child care. We've had meetings um, at Bree College, and we, we have, we're in education, and they all have background checks, so we, and they're trained, so we have had um, programs um, during the weekend where we'll actually babysit for the kids, so mm -hmm. then the, their mom or dad, whoever is the teacher, can join the meeting. Um, we also pay them for their, their time at that meeting because that's a weekend and mm -hmm. they should be compensated for their time, but Great question, though. Mm -hmm. Question. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, I, I uh, grew up in. I was born and grew up in, in Africa, so I didn't grow up in the American racial debate and conflict and everything. So I'm trying to be as objective as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we do, like uh, my experience is a business, so we do sport analysis, which is strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. So opportunity and threat are something that come from the outside, the environment. Strength and weakness are something inside of you. Mm. And there are some relationships. The thing was, ethnographic studies, which I have seen before, or like memoirs, mm. uh, they don't talk about their weaknesses. You know, the personal weaknesses, they, they talk about the threats kind of like mm. outside. Mm. So that's why I like objective, research, you know, numbers and stuff. Uh, there are about 1.5 million faculty members in the United States. 50 mm -hmm. something percent are you know, permanent, another mm -hmm. isn't whatever. Mm -hmm. About 19,000, no, 1,900 colleges and universities giving 40 degree, 40 degrees. So this is like a very diverse, very wide range mm -hmm. thing. So I don't know whether we can generalize uh, aspects from a few people numbers. Mm -hmm. But according to numbers, African Americans tend to go to lower quality schools. Okay? Mm -hmm. They tend to graduate with lower grades. Mm -hmm. I mean these are just facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know whether you have heard of Sanders, he's a University of California professor, law professor, he did research about law firms. Mm -hmm. Law firms hire a lot of minorities, but they don't promote them. Mm -hmm. It's the partnership track. Mm -hmm. And he did not dismiss racism, of course there, should mm -hmm. be, there is racism, mm -hmm. but also African Americans tend to have a lower LSAT score. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In college, they have lower scores or GPAs. Mm -hmm. In law school, they tend to have lower GPAs. Bar exam, they tend to fail more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they go into the business, mm -hmm. they tend to you know, miss that track, partnership track. So mm -hmm. the point is, I understand the racism part of it, I understand the structural racism part of it, mm -hmm. but we also have to talk about the weaknesses within the minority communities. Can, can I respond to that? Because I, 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 follow, I, I follow that through line for sure. And by the way, I would just say one, <clears throat> push back with the objection of the stats and everything. Um, one thing is, you know, statistics. I get, I get the objective thing, but, um, you know, when I was in, in my doctorate, <clears throat> one of my first stats class, we, we talked about things like missing data, 
what you do, right? Imputation or, well, if you use, if, well, what, what are you going to do? If you use imputation, that's a form of bias, you know, you can yeah. do, right? So there, but I, I follow. So my response to you is this. <clears throat> Gloria Latson Billings, she has two pieces that respond, I think, really well to this. The first is a book chapter where she writes about um, critical race theory, and she says what critical race theory isn't, okay? So that's the one thing. The second is her presidential address that was turned into an article on, on the opportunity um, gaps that exist in education and society, which she labels the educational debt. So those two things, to me, help respond to your question. Okay, what CRT is not. She talks about a um, black professor, young female, who is writing a lot about racism, to your point. This is, they got us down, they got us down, they got us down. And then at the end, she says, but did you do what I told you? Did you, did you do what, you know, what Daisy had talked about? Have you published? Did you do the grant? Did you do this? I gave you feedback. So she's talking about it like as a mentor. She's a black woman mentoring a young, um, rising black female. And she said, no, but they're racist. She's like, yes, I get that. That's part of it. But I gave you feedback on that grant. You missed the deadline. Are you supposed to keep your job if you didn't get the grant? She's like, what well, is racism? So what she was trying to get at is you can't just, just say racism from the mountaintop. That doesn't help anybody. And then the second was the opportunity gaps that exist. Those aren't achievement gaps. So when you say like the LSAT, right, there's differences in scores, that's an observation, that's a trend, that is a statistic, yeah. that is a pattern. But beneath that, we should ask why? What leads to that? And in, in, her, in her presidential address and article, she talks about this historical arc of time of not investing in black and brown and indigenous bodies. And they are, right, it, the starting line of the race has not, it's not an equal starting point. And so um, I take all of that to say, you're right, we always need to be self-improving but the patterns of lack of diversity, to me, seem to be a, a, a byproduct of a man-made problem, right? You know, because you need to get opportunities, right? I, I, I'm not denying that, and mm -hmm. I know that, like, supporting African Americans and expanding to do tutorials, mm -hmm. uh, you know, giving classes, you know, it could be in any field, it could be in engineering where a lot of African Americans are not there. There are different ways of doing it. But some people think that just because that happened, we have to lower standards. The same way in New York City, there are about seven uh, magnet schools mm -hmm. for engineering, like Brooklyn Tech. Mm -hmm. And only a few number of African Americans or Hispanics go to those schools. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. seven out of 800, like crazy number. Mm -hmm. And they want to lower the standards. Mm -hmm. you know? And that doesn't solve anything. That's my point. Support kids coming out by giving them grants, by giving them money, mm -hmm. training, family involvement, but lowering standards of tenorship. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to publish. You have to publish because mm -hmm. that's your job, you know? Mm -hmm. Publishing is research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing you talked about, age, mm -hmm. I mean, crystallite intelligence, they call it, Mm -hmm. Depends on age. That's why you see most Nobel Prize winners to be in their 60s and 70s, because it's a accumulation of, you know, research and, and knowledge that gives them the impact. And yeah, absolutely. And those panels, I mean, reviewers, you know, when when you when you peer review do peer reviewed articles, you know, it isn't a meritocracy. There are plenty of great ideas that scholars of color have tried to introduce into the mainstream, but those gatekeepers. Can so there's there is a dynamic. I, I totally feel what you're saying and hear you totally. Like in economics, there are five big journals, and mm -hmm. 
all of them are friends. If, if you look yeah, yeah, they're all friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If yeah. you look at the economics journals, all of them are friends from yep. Yale, Princeton, yep. uh, Harvard, or yep. like they're like buddies. Yeah. So I know. Yeah, it's very like incestuous, very homophilous. They're all together. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's but also, there should be some understanding of weaknesses and trying to achieve something mm -hmm. too. Like for sure. For sure. Crying racism without doing something. <laughs> Work. Yes. And we have tried that for the last 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Anthony? Anthony? Yeah. We have an online question from uh, the Ruth Shorku colleague, who's actually our past, one of our past interim directors here at the Institute. Uh, he says that this phenomenon that he described seems to be new to most university uh, faculty. What seems to be the fundamental theme of such discrimination? Do you have a short term or long term solution for this problem? I'll put my colleague on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> that way, Can I you repeat up. the question just once, yeah, Anthony, please? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I don't know if I would say that it is new uh, to everyone. Um, and maybe it's new to white folks, or maybe it's new to non-white folks who are just seeing themselves in its definition or its outcomes. That's that's what I would say to that point. Um, I think it's important to, to, so to speak, name the problem so that people can then work with it, for, uh, people from a range of different backgrounds and perspectives and identifications. Um, so as we said in some of our recommendations, I think short term is um, making sure that hiring committees, for example, are having training. For example, at my college, we have on every search committee a diversity advocate, and so that's somebody who's charged with speaking up if if people are not um, doing the the search properly, right? And so that person is kind of checking everybody's assumptions and comments and uh, evaluating criteria or what have you on, on the people um, that are that are being considered for positions. In terms of long term, you know, we talked a few minutes ago about are we lowering the standards? Maybe we're changing the standards. Maybe we were recognize that publishing you know, seven journal articles in seven years to get tenure is less important than maybe five and more service activities or more mentorship. So um, I think you know, colleges and universities are reevaluating what does matter to us and what does make a good faculty member. Nicholas? Yeah, and, and I would say, yeah, I would agree. I, 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 it might be new to some, but it's, this work has been um, going on since um, even before William Smith, um, his mentor, um, Chester Pierce. So my, my, my thought of it is when we think about discri um, discrimination, I think of hiring, and, and that was one of the big, big threads um, in the book, is the consultants who... Um, the search firms, when they when they say, "Oh, you've been recognized to by someone, you've been nominated, you should apply for this position," you know, search firms make a lot of money, and they are part of the gatekeeping mechanism, from my perspective and experience. Um, how they screen candidates and their alignment, but remember, they're a byproduct of who hired them. The the, the institutions that pay them that. $250,000 retainer to hire, they're wanting an outcome. And until Harvard, it was just in the, in the media now, first time that they'll have a, a black uh, president, female president. It, it's called Ivy League for a reason, you know. Um, so I, I, I think that until those patterns change, um, and everyone has their perspective on it, but I see it's all interconnected, and 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 that's the challenge, and and that's what I wake up energized for, because it is a racial battle fatigue, it is a fight, and so far I'm not, I'm you know I'm always going to be getting up. Um, yeah, go for. It. Bear with me as <laughs> I try to frame this question. Um, Something you had said in the beginning and from personal experiences, mm -hmm. I have found that spaces with good intention mm -hmm. are the most exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of tool sets and all of those things, recognizing that they're trying or think they're doing good work, but recognizing that, you know, how do you navigate 
having to often people in hierarchically higher places than typically I would be in. Um, just kind of calling out like, I understand that you are mm -hmm. trying to do good, but the outcomes are actually this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's an important point, and I kind of touched on that a couple of times. I think having something, like I mentioned a moment ago, having a diversity advocate identified in a group so that it doesn't become personal, right? So that it's not me calling you out personally as a colleague, but rather, hey, this is my job, or this is what I was charged with. I'm just doing my work. Um, but I think also having, you know, people maybe from the outside, whether, you know, if I'm on a committee, a uh, um, you know, dissertation committee and I'm from a different university or something like that maybe so that there can be s some more objective um, stance. Um, but I think also just training, maybe even sharing uh, like a book like this where you can read the stories about well-meaning committees or well-meaning faculty and the, uh, the problematic outcomes that resulted. Um, and I, you know, what is it about well-meaning groups that are so exhausting? And, um, and, and, and perhaps it's that we are less able or b not brave enough to call them out because they are well-meaning, right? And so we're, we're kind of tiptoeing around it, but I, I think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard that the road, the path to hell has been, you know, <laughs> paved in good intentions, and, and those are the most dangerous people, according to Martin Luther King, um, Jr. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> um, it's so, you know, that's studying higher education and systems, um, these problems are so entrenched, it's, it's challenging. While you're making progress in certain spaces, you're losing and, and losing ground in others. Um, and that's the problem I see. It, it's very, very basic, I guess, because I study inequality. Um, for instance, um, the, the, the idea of hiring, you know, cluster hires. Okay, we call it cluster hire, we call it group hiring. Is, will you retain those people? Mm -hmm. Have you done any house cleaning of the institution? It might be a very racial hostile place and hiring five people of color together, um, that's not gonna solve anything. And so, um, good intentions, um, I agree, very challenging. I'm interested in seeing people who are willing to grow and change and transform. But there again, systems thinking, institutions don't want to change. They, they're actually designed to protect that. And so when you bring in new ideas, it's hard for them to swallow. Um, and and, and what, what is your thought? I mean, mm -hmm. so you asked the question, mm -hmm. yeah, help maybe share some processing that you're going through. While we were discussing this mm -hmm. prior, um, kind of trying to navigate the difference between diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. and I personally am most interested in inclusivity, and what does that mm -hmm. actually mean as the like final frontier? Like, yes, it's one thing to bring people in, yes, it's one thing to remove barriers, but for me, inclusivity is actually integrating mm -hmm. each person that comes into space, and that becomes less about the person, not that sounds wrong, but mm -hmm. more of our readiness and willingness to actually allow those perspectives to be, to change the organization. Yeah, your thought made me think of one, one thing. So when we also think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, I would argue, um, we think of it through our own schema and filters. It might be cultural, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, religion. One thing that I think that we forget about is ideology, mm -hmm. right? So I think that a mark of a good higher ed space would be, could a person that's voting for Donald Trump have a civil conversation with a person who is voting for Biden, right? <laughs> and so um, ideological and political diversity, I think, is one. And, I, and I've heard of institution, um, there's a president that wanted to ensure that the incoming class had a good mix of progressive-oriented, um, right-leaning, left-leaning, centrist, independent. And to me, that's really fascinating, too, because... Uh, at least my, my blind spot is when I think of inclusion, I'm not thinking about that type of diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of more 
you know, visible. Um, and what about class diversity? Mm -hmm. That is very important because the institutions are replicating um, when you see what schools produce, kid, you know, kids that are coming from the 1% or the top 3%, there's no class diversity. And that's, that's challenging to me. That's, that's a, a system of, of, of um, you know, serfs and different people. That's a caste system. Um, you're just born into it by the best predictor is, you know, what, what kind of car your mom and dad drive. I mean, that, that doesn't seem right to me. If you can change your stars, it should be because of the gray matter. Uh, I, I don't know, have you ever read uh, Scott Page? He's uh, from uh, at the University of Michigan, and he, he wrote books like Diversity, Bonus, uh, The Difference. I mean, he is a well-known guy in the diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about cognitive diversity, mm. and uh, he also relates identity diversity, like race, with cognitive diversity, because people from different backgrounds, including race, ethnicity, or nationality, bring different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So he connects that, uh, and, and diverse people are more productive, more innovative, because of, you know they bring different perspectives. Uh, you should check him out, it's Scott Page. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I hate this, this word, diversity and inclusion, because for me it's about, I'm gonna include you, you know? I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna make you part of me. Like, very mm -hmm. demeaning, for me, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I better use the term or the phrase diversity and partnership, mm -hmm. because it's more respectful, and it's more about my perspective, which I'm bringing for our benefit for all of us. Inclusion is, I don't know, you include somebody because he feels not included, or you feel inferior, or you're in yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Or the assumption is that this is the group and we bring them into this group because it's superior, or yeah. the, the way to do it, or what have you, rather than... Um, it, for me, it reminds me like when you're in a... In a school cafeteria mm -hmm. and you're by yourself and oh come on let, let's include yeah you. right and so i don't know i don't know about the word equity i mean i don't even know what they're trying to say with equity but I think that I think it's moved in the direct a positive direction because before it was like building tolerance. It's like no, no, I don't don't just tolerate me. Like b include me. But I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. yeah. Well, it's suggesting uh, equal terrain or what have you, right? A yeah. balanced relationship. So and independence and interdependence. Yes, right. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm trying to work on that like a business thing. Mm -hmm. Created with my friends, and I'm deciding not to use the United States because mm -hmm. I think partnership is a better, mm -hmm. it's a very respectful way of like, you know, I respect your ideas, mm -hmm. so come to me. Sure, sure. Uh, Connie online asks, uh, could you share more about the theme of white epistemology and alternative ways of knowing and feeling? You provide some examples. And what was the last part? Yeah, for, uh, providing some examples. Oh, of of um, what epistemology is the ways of knowing and being. Sure, sure. <clears throat> one one could be the example of the the cleaning lady who said, you know, wh why why are you here? And then the black woman saying, you know, I'm this is my office. It says Buchanan right here. I'm Buchanan. Um, that would be an example because. Um, the notion um, when you think of a professor, the cleaning lady is clearly she knows she's on a college campus cleaning offices. So um, she must have had cognitive dissonance like, what? This black woman clearly is in the wrong place. And an example of that was Henry uh, mm -hmm. Skip Gates when he mm -hmm. was accosted at his own house. Here you have a yeah. endowed Harvard professor who's on mainstream PBS, all these shows, right? And it's like, this is my house. Um, other examples? Well, I was gonna add to the story, which I just remembered kind of the final part of the story with the housekeeper, and correct me if I'm misremembering this, mm -hmm. was that, the, that after um, Dr. Buchanan left and the next day she came in and her, dress, her office drawers had been um, tampered with yes. and things dumped onto the ground and yes. there was only two people with the key yes. other than campus safety. So yes. um, that was yes. that just added to her racial battle fatigue. 
So, I mean, I think kind of going back to what are our standards of, of tenure and promotion, uh, they have been set, they've been in stone at my college, as far as I know, for 30, 40 years. That's how we've done things and that's how we've rewarded people. And that's what we've told people is important when they've been interviewing with us. Um, I know I'm chairing a committee right now um, for, a, for a new position. And one of the things that we made sure is that we weren't signaling the wrong thing in the words that we used in our job description. So for example, we said, um, you know, the candidate must be able to, would be expected to teach a senior seminar in criminal justice. And then we set, stepped back from that and said, might a new junior faculty member not feel adept or prepared to teach a senior seminar if they don't have years of teaching? So we changed that language. Um, and so I think, you know, just maybe reevaluating, um, kind of always with a new set of eyes or new new lens to make sure that the way we've always done it isn't the only way, or that we're not cutting certain people out from even applying. Um, and, and, and I think Daisy too related to what she just said is spot on is when the hiring authorities because again we're talking faculty this book is faculty in higher ed um, when you're applying for positions um, if it's faculty you're meeting um, with deans provost or if you're applying for a, a, pro, a, a dean you're, you're meeting with the provost and president I guess the point I'm getting at is when that review committee is looking at so, someone's vita and trying to understand, well, what's your trajectory? Why did you do this? A white epistemology might say, oh, I look at your Vita and it's so discombobulated, it makes no sense. Well, a good practice would be, hey, unpack that for me. And if you had that advocate, they, can, they might say, well, look, no, it's actually very clear. Do you see how she jumped from, or they, I don't know what pronoun I'm using, but the candidate jumped from, this this institution to this institution, it wasn't a it wasn't um, you know a, a a decline. They made that move laterally because this is why they you right. So it's 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 that understanding the behavior, um, and and that's that's important. What do you think about the lady? Uh, do you remember the sixteen nineteen project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sixteen. Yeah. What happened yeah. to her? I heard that she they wouldn't take her. At, UNC and yes, yeah, she she um, she um, wanted they it was political. Uh, she ended up at um, Howard University, I Howard. think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. H Hannah Nicole Jones. Yeah. She, she was a journalist. She was a yeah. She was a journalist. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, and there again is is kind of uh, again the institution and in the in that case you know I think it, you might have donors who donate millions of dollars and they want some dis decisions in this and when we're talking higher ed I, my my thing is generating new cutting edge knowledge and the inquiry drives everything right. Um, but in a lot of cases, was she an academic? Or did she have? She wasn't in. I mean, she was a journalist, I think, by training. Yeah. Yeah. But what about HBC? Is the last question I'm going to ask. What do you think is the future? Because you know, I I don't know. Like before, like segregation and stuff, they had like some purpose, and you know, Thurgood Marshall went there a lot. You know. Now, number one, they don't have a lot of money. I mean, they're getting some money from the government now. Mm -hmm. I think Trump started giving them money. But uh, do you think they have like a future? Yeah, I think their future is bright. I think okay. they're I think there's always there's always going to be a need for HBCUs and I think Deion Sanders helped. I think I yeah, I don't think they're going away. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't I agree. think they yeah, I think there's I was trying to think of some witty on the fly uh, metaphor of why it won't go away, but because they were having a lot of financial problems. Right? Yeah, of course, that's the one thing I I do know um, as of late talking with my colleagues who work at HBCUs is the infrastructure and and the but um, as as we were talking earlier, um, Bezos' wife has been given some money and okay. and even other um, um, other funders find um, private. Um, philanthropic, they understand that they need capacity building grants. Mm -hmm. They yeah. need infrastructure. And as someone who worked at an MSI, yeah, your paperwork and inefficiencies, that that um, is at an institutional level. But the faculty themselves are some of the most cerebral and brightest leaders, luminaries mm -hmm. in the field. 
Um, and um, so the star power is there. They just need some resources is really what they need. I mean, they might consolidate. That's what I'm... Yeah, they, 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 that's always, I mean, that's, that's a problem. Well, that's, like, as you mentioned earlier in your comments about the how many, I mean, that's always an a issue nationwide. 50% mm -hmm. of their staff is the administrative staff. I don't know mm -hmm. why they have that much of their staff. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. maybe AI might replace most of the things that the administrative staff are doing for that. It takes away a lot of money you can give to researchers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also predatory because what happens is PWIs glom on to um, HBCUs or MSI because the grant requires partnership. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's predatory. Yeah, so you can be a subcontractor with us. And yeah, that HBCU or the MSI gets some money, but really um, it's parasitic mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's not, it's benefiting the PWI, right? It's like, we haven't heard from you for, oh, can you get that letter of support for us? We're writing that letter of intent for the letter of interest for that grant. It's like, oh, that's how this relationship works, mm -hmm. right? So um, it goes back to your point, partnership, reciprocity, um, bit sharing of resources. But oftentimes what happens, it's, it's not. It's top down and unidirectional. The thing is, I was talking to the head of the NSF, uh, like University and College Grant. She's the head of that department from DC, and she just said they started a new program to uh, include community colleges and uh, HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So they didn't do that uh, at the bigger scale before, mm -hmm. but now they don't want to give you know whatever community-based research. Mm -hmm. They're better fitted to do that than going to Harvard and asking mm -hmm. them to do some big things. So that might help mm -hmm. a lot. The, I know it's our book talk, but I'll put a plug in for a book mm -hmm. that you could read that's really fascinating about this topic is um, Jim Crow's Pink Slip. Um, Pink Slip. Yes, okay. it's a new book, and it's a counter story. I don't even say it's a counter story. It is a historical document that talks about black excellence. And what happened was... The, the United States, um, white teachers, uh, black teachers were fired and replaced with mediocre white female yeah. teachers. It's, it's verified, check that book out. And that's that story, what I was saying, thinking mm -hmm. about, is if we don't know our history, people will lie to us. There has been a country, so to your point of like, um, you, you mentioned how we need to look at ourselves in the mirror. That's absolutely true, I, I'm not questioning that. But it's also to tell our people we come from a history of a lineage of black excellence or, yeah. or Asian excellence, in this case, black excellence. And um, that's not taught in the, in the schools. It's not in the curriculum, you know. So that's, that's not helping us either. I use a collective we. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to thank Dr. Hartlip and Ball again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you can purchase Racial Battle Fatigue and Faculty online from the Rutledge website for $31.96. Uh, the link is available on their talk webpage on each of your chairs. There's also the flyer with the 20% discount code. Uh, a good holiday gift since the you know, next <laughs> match is yeah, coming yeah. soon. Uh, please join us again in January for our next lecture and also for our new Airy Reads Book Club. We will be reading Anti-Man, a hybrid memoir by Rajiv Mohabir. And with that, uh, have a good evening. Remember to be upstander if you see a fellow person in need, and happy holidays. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.